Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to the tutorial on causal AI for web and healthcare. My name is Utkarshni. So before I start talking about causal AI for web and healthcare or causality, I just wanted to talk about something that just happened yesterday. So I'm not sure some of us were traveling. So how many of us have gotten a chance to watch the TEDx talk that was posted uh, by Yeshin Choi? on why AI is incredibly smart and shockingly stupid. And she has uh, mentioned that AI needs common sense. AI does not have the understanding of common sense, which is very, which is, she, she quoted that phrase that common sense is very uncommon or is not so common in people. She also mentioned this uh, thought study where the AI system was asked to optimize the supply chain of uh, or su supply of paper clips. And what it's to eventually what it started is okay, let me maximize the supply of paper clips. But then it started killing humans to maximize the supply of that paper clips. So that's common sense for us. If you want to expand a supply of something or have a uh, more production of something that doesn't mean that we'll start killing humans and start building more factories which is something which is very innate or intuitive to us we don't do that but ai systems they don't have this understanding she also mentioned something as uh after killing humans the system might just start chopping the trees we don't do that we know that some things are legal what is morals what ethical so how do you make these AI systems have this common sense understanding. And I feel, and I, I think causality is part of it's a step more than common sense. So you have, um, it, it understands the consequences. Like we understand the consequences or what would be the consequence of if I stop cutting, if I start chopping off the plants or trees in the world. So what if I chop off these trees, what's going to happen? We understand the consequences. That's counterfactual for us. We have this, what is the cause of, uh, let's say, killing all the humans? What's going to happen? So there was a very interesting uh, talk. I'm not sure if you guys have watched it, but if you didn't, I recommend that maybe after the presentation, after the tutorial, you can go and watch that TEDx talk. So enough of that. Let's start with the tutorial. So causal AI for web and healthcare. I'll be presenting this tutorial with my colleagues, Usha Lokala, Kaushik Roy, and my advisor, Dr. Amit Shad. So let me first start with what is causality? So causality is an influence by which one event, process, state, or object contributes to the production of another event, process, state, or object where the cause is partly responsible for the effect and the effect is partly dependent on the cause. As I mentioned earlier, it's very, it's easy for us to grasp the concept of causality. So if I have this cup here, I'm gonna push this cup over this uh, podium, it's gonna fall. So I know that my pushing the cup causes this cup to fall down. And if, if it was made of ceramic, it's gonna break. Causality is this relationship of A causes B. And we are all well aware of this uh, famous notion, correlation is not causation. So if a younger drivers are highly correlated with being in an accident, that does not mean that age causes the accident. So why are we here this morning talking about causality early in the morning? Why, why is it so important? So back in 2020, there were uh, articles and news uh, clippings about there was more evidence of smokers being less at risk of COVID-19. Counterintuitive, right? So smoking damages your lungs, COVID-19 damages your lungs. So you should be more at risk of COVID-19, not less at risk of COVID-19. So does that mean we should all start smoking? Obviously not. I hope so not. So what happened actually? So at the start of the pandemic, due to limited testing, only healthcare workers who did not smoke and people with severe COVID-19 uh, symptoms were tested. Smokers with no COVID-19 symptoms were underrepresented in this observed data set. Out of the ones who are tested, non-smokers are more likely to have COVID-19 
than the smokers. So this data is imbalanced, which leads to the correlation that smoking has reduced risk of COVID-19. Relying on the correlation data from the uh, relying on correlation from the observation data can lead to embarrassing, costly, and dangerous mistakes such as smoking has less risk, leads to less risk to COVID-19. So to overcome similar situations and to make actionable decisions, we need to understand causality. What are the use of causality in modern day and age? So it's used to study user behavior in industries like Spotify, Amazon, Netflix, where they're doing A-B testing, where they implement a feature, push it in the, uh, in the production cycle, test it with few users, and see how does the users respond to the new future, feature that has been implemented. It is used for randomized control trial to understand the effect of a drug. It's used for policy intervention. So for example, if a government, let's say, intervenes and say, I'm going to, uh, we are going to increase the interest rate by 1%. So does that government, now the government will have to wait certain years to figure out what's going to be the effect of this policy intervention. We cannot do that. We cannot have this po uh, policy intervention and then wait a few years and see what's going to be the effect of this. So causality helps with policy intervention, social media intervention to study the population dynamics. So if I want to learn how does the effect of, or looking at the Twitter data or the social media data, how can we influence the election? Just example might look at the previous act actors who are responsible for influencing or who causes a riot in uh, the crowd. They're able to uh, stir some uh, sentiments in, uh, in the population out there on social media. Another example. So observation data is not sufficient for these use cases. We cannot go back in time and observe these changes. So what are we gonna talk about? Just a few highlights that we'll be mentioning. Why statistical AI is not enough. Causal AI and causal knowledge graph as a step towards neurosymbolic AI. Can ontologies be used as inference for causal explanations? Can causal AI enable intervention, planning, and policy decision-making? And can causal inference serve as a bridge between prediction and decision-making? This is the outline of the uh, tutorial. So we'll start with causal AI, primer to causal AI. We'll talk about causal knowledge graph, ontology and knowledge-based inference for causal explanation, application of causal AI in web and healthcare use cases. So let's start with causality. Causation and statistics. This is not new to humans. We have been talking about this since Aristotle. And even before Aristotle, Plato was interested in it, in understanding causes of things around him. So why his questions was why each thing comes into existence and why it goes out of the existence and why it exists. And according to him, the question of why helps with this explanations that he uh, comes about the world. Aristotle said his predecessors lack the complete understanding of range of causes and their systematic interrelations. Their use of causality was not supported by adequate theory of causality. We have proper knowledge uh, of the things only when we have understood the cause of those things. So he came up with four uh, causes, material cause, formal cause, efficient cause, and final cause. So material causes, let's say we have a table, material cause would be, what is it made of? It's made of wood. Formal cause would be, what is a design form? So the design form is, has four legs and a platform over the top. Efficient causes, where does this change comes from? You make the table a carpet, using carpentry, a carpenter makes the table. And what final cause it, what is it used for? So it's this final cause which is most important as without this others would not have happened. You need to have a final cause. You need to have, okay, what am I going to use this table for? This table would be used for dining or would be used as my study table. Then in 1500, for Francis Bacon, he is known as the father of empiricism, which says that knowledge comes from sensory experiences. He was also one of the founders of modern sciences and helped in development of scientific methods in modern science. In trying to explain, um, sorry, according, <laughs> see, according to Bacon, what he was trying to do, he wanted to investigate the causes of a phenomenon. They must, so what do you, uh, if you're trying to explain a cause of a phenomenon, 
you must have a list. So you have a list of things in which the phenomena occurs, and then you have a list of things in which the phenomena did not occur. Then rank the list according to the degree in which the phenomena occur in each one. And then using this method, we should be able to deduce the factors which cause the occurrence of that phenomena in one list and it does not occur in the other list. And to explain this, he gave this example that if there's an army, an army is successful when it's commanded by Essex, a commander of army, and it's not successful when not commanded by Essex. And the success also depends on, uh, depends on how much commander Essex is engaged with the army. So we can scientifically and reasonably say that being commanded by Essex is the cause of army's success. After uh, Sir Francis Bacon, Galileo, uh, Galileo, he talks about causality in controlled experiment, which involves lots of control factors. So in these experiments, you take one factor and change its value while keeping others fixed and observe the effect of the outcome while understanding what causes and what is the process. After Galileo, Yudmi, uh, Yudni Yule, he looked at causal question using techniques like regression. So he used, uh, back in England, he wanted to understand or look at the causal question, whether or not putting people in welfare led to becoming them dependent on government or becoming self-reliant and getting back on their feet. Charles Spearman, after UA, he was the first person to take uh, seriously using the statistical sort of evidence to get at the hidden variables, so which we cannot observe directly. So he came up with something known as general intelligence G, where he argued if you give multiple tests to people on math and reading and look at the correlation between those tests, there are a pattern of constraints that we could observe in those correlation, which would confirm that there is general intelligence. And the constraint is called a tetrad equation. So it says, if you have four variables, then the product of two correlations permutated all three way are equal, uh, are equal and then you have a, a, tra a tetrad constraint. So which you can test in the data and which will confirm that you have something unobserved that behaves in a certain way and is causing those tests. Sewell Wright, who was a biologist, genetist, uh, genetist, he wanted to see what is the de what degree of the fur color of the parent determines the fur color of the offspring in guinea uh, in guinea pigs. So he was the it was the first time in causality with where causality received a mathematical representation because he was able to represent this using path diagrams, which became a uh, precursor to causal graph. And he used these coefficient weights, W, uh, of the path diagrams to estimate the effect of, or the estimate the weight of a particular gene in the final uh, uh, color of the fur of the offspring. After civil right, Ronald Fisher, he took Galileo's approach a step further. And instead of controlling every factor in the experiment, you randomly assigned one of the factors and let all the other factors distribute even probabilistically or statistically. And we can accomplish the same thing as Galileo, but then you have to make stat and then you can make statistical inf inference whether or not you are being effective in this random assignment or not. After Fisher, Jersey, Neyman. This name is should be common to, uh, common to people when they think about potential outcome or uh, Neyman and Rubin causal models. So Neyman formalized the potential outcome framework. So giving a treatment to one individual and control to the other, he was interested in finding what would have happened had we given a different treatment than we already did. And he formalized this idea, which was then later extended by Don, uh, Don Rubens. And this famous is widely used in epidemiology and biological uh, studies. So potential outcome was very clear and uh, powerful. So if you have, if you're very, if you're confident in your model and your causal model in the understanding model and the parameter to estimate, you can use potential outcome uh, framework there. Jamie Robin took ideas from civil right uh, along with Judy Apple and came up with graphical causal model. So for the sake of this, uh, this tutorial, we'll be focusing on graphical causal models. Causal inference requires more than probability. 
So pro uh, prediction from observation is not equals to prediction from interventions. So in this causal, di uh, causal Bayesian network, you see, the smoking causes lung cancer and yellow stained finger, and yellow stained finger causes lung cancer. So the probability of, uh, the observation probability of that the person would get a lung cancer in 1960, given there is a treatment in uh, 19, given there is a tar stained fingers in 1950 uh, equals to no, is not equal to the intervention when you do a uh, intervention that, okay, what is the probability or what are the chances that the person would have a lung cancer where I explicitly put a, a intervention or set the value of tar stained finger as no in my interventional data. Causal prediction, mm -hmm. causal prediction versus statistical prediction. So when do we do causal versus statistical prediction? So for the statistical prediction, we have observational data, background knowledge, and using these two, you might be able to estimate or inference about the probability distribution which governs the variable distribution in some population. Once we have all that, we can estimate the conditional probability of y given x and z. But for the causal prediction, we need to know the causal structure. And then after the causal structure and the distribution, we can estimate, <laughs> we will be able to estimate the probability, probability of Y, interventional probability of Y given X and Z. So this is a common practice in statistical inference or prediction where people are trying to predict Y in this uh, causal context. So now difference between causal estimation and causal search, which is also known as discovery. So we'll take these two examples. So for the estimation, there was this study by Hernan and uh, his colleagues where he was trying to estimate the effect of zevoduvine on survival among HIV positive patients. And uh, so they were, the, confo the confounder, the CD4 lymphocyte count, it varies over time and are dependent on previous treatment of zevoduvine. And they uh, took a study, so it varies over time, and you want to study what is the effect of this drug at a particular time or during the treatment procedure. And they use this method of marginal structure model, but now people have also used, there's another method called path-specific policies, dynamic treatment regimes, which can be used to learn the estimates uh, or effects of these drugs over, over, over the period of time. Some of the assumptions that one makes in these uh, estimation uh, problems. So you, the treatment is measured reliably. Measured coefficients are sufficient to capture major source of confounding and model of the treatment given in the past is accurate. For the causal search problem, uh, there were researchers in Zurich which were trying to uh, predict which genes reg regulate the flowering of Arbutopsips uh, flower. So the problem is, there are 25,000 potential genes which are responsible for the flowering. Are you gonna sit and downregulate and analyze those genes? You'll downregulate some, you'll upregulate some. This is very time consuming. So instead of that, they used graphical structure learning algorithms to figure out a causal model, which genes are uh, causes the flowering of this uh, flower. The assumptions that one would make here is RNA microwave microstructure are reasonably proxy for gene expression expression, and you have a causal Markov assumption. So causal Markov assumption is, if there's a, there's a node in a causal Bayesian network, is independent of all the nodes which are not its direct cause. And they were potentially able to have a model. They had possible 25 possible model, out of which 13 were possible to test it because of the availability of the seeds, and nine produced viable plants, out of which four had successful flowering time. Let's talk about the uh, graphical causal model that we'll be, figuring, uh, we'll be talking about in uh, this presentation. And the famous thing when to talk about causality, people usually talk about ladder of causation by Dr. Yuda Pearl. So there are three rungs in the ladder of causation. The lowest rung or the first rung of ladder of causation talks about association, which means seeing or observing, what are uh, observing activities around yourself. And the questions that you can ask is, what if I see, how would seeing X change my belief in Y? So that could be, uh, for example, what does this symptom tell me about the disease? 
what does a survey tell me about the election? Moving up the ladder of causation, the second rung talks about intervention, where you are in coming in and intervening into the system and observing the effect of it. You could ask questions such as, what if I do this? What if I do X? What would uh, Y be if I do X? For example, if I take X aspirin, will my headache be cured? The topmost rung, uh, rung for ladder of causation is counterfactual, where you are imagining, retrospecting, and trying to understand the system. So you ask questions like, what if I had done so and so? For example, was it the aspirin that caused my uh, that cured my headache, or was it the short nap that I took which cured my headache? Going up the ladder of causation from association to counterfactual, we are moving from the current statistical based AI to neurosymbolic hybrid AI using human like symbolic knowledge, which can be used for reasoning tasks such as causality. Counterfactuals. What are counterfactuals? It's so counterfactual could be what if I had I woken up five minutes later, I might have been late. To, work, to, to the tutorial. That's a counterfactual. We do that every day. We always think about the consequences of our actions. We think about what if I had taken a certain action or certain decision sometime in my life, where would I have been? And this has been very beautifully portrayed or talked about by the poet Robert Frost in his poem, The Path Not Taken, where the traveler is always uh, is thinking about, should I take the trail A or the trail B. If I take the path A or trail A or the path on the right, it might. What if it might lead me to a beautiful uh, trail? Will I meet strangers? Will my uh, journey be more comfortable compared to the other path which is in front of me? So, human mind has this ability to conceive alternative or this non-existent world. We think about, oh, what if I had my superhero uh, or super uh, power? What would I do? Those are counterfactuals for us. We can see what might have happened, imagine, be prepared, and act in counterfactual scenarios. Counterfactual reasoning requires causal structures. For causal structures, one of the best way to represent causal structure is causal Bayesian network. So a causal Bayesian network is a graphical representation to express causal knowledge. It's a Bayesian network in which each node is independent of all its non-descendants given its parent. And the directed edges represents causal relation between the corresponding node. So in this asthma causal Bayesian network, we have colon. So asthma, asthmatic patient are known to be susceptible to allergens out there. So an outdoor allergen colon causes the, a symptom, which could be cough, chest tightness, wheezing, and which eventually causes the intake of medication in them. Could be a rescue med medication. They have to take an inhaler urgently. So uh, pollen or outdoor allergen causes the intake of medication and causes uh, a symptom. And then symptom causes the intake of medication. Now, coming back to the ladder of causation, we'll try to answer the questions of intervention, uh, association, and counterfactual using this causal uh, Bayesian network, asthma causal Bayesian network that we just seen. So talking about the last rung of ladder of, the first rung of ladder of causation, what is the presence of symptom tells us about the intake of medication by our patient, which would be, what is the probability that the patient took a medication given there was a symptom or the symptom is true? The second ladder of uh, rung for ladder of causation, which is intervention or doing, he would ask questions such as what would be the effect of symptom on medication intake? So what's going to be, what, uh, if, what would be the effect if there was a symptom, would I still take a medication versus if there was no symptom uh, observed by this patient, which is estimated by total causal effect, which is a binary treatment on the outcome by and defined in this interventional uh, con contrast where you're using do calculus to explicitly set the value for the intervention, in this case, symptom. The top miss ladder of causation, which is counterfactual. You ask questions such as, give a, given a patient has taken the medication, what is the chance that they would not take it if they didn't have a symptom? I'll read it again. Given a patient has taken the medication, I had already taken the medication, what is the chance that the patient would not have not taken it? So 
I've already taken it. That's a fact. Now I'm thinking, I'm counterspecting, I'm imagining. What if I had not taken it if they didn't have a symptom, if I didn't have a symptom? To answer the counterfactual questions, we have two different types of causal effects, natural direct effect and natural indirect effect. In natural direct effect, you're asking questions such as, given the pollen in the outdoor environment, that what is the chance the patient took the medication, but the symptom was not due to the pollen? So you use natural direct effect, pollen, you took the medication because of the pollen. So pollen gets the value of yes for the medication, but for the symptom, the pollen, intervene, uh, you do, do calculus and intervene and sets the value of no. So this natural direct, eff uh, direct effect of a binary treatment on an outcome Y with mediator X is given by the counterfactual contrast formula here where the subscript x0 refers to the counterfactual distribution of x where for, for which the treatment is zero or false in this case. Natural direct indirect effect. So we ask questions such as, given there is allergen or pollen in the outdoor environment, what is the chance the patient took the medication, but the symptom was due to an allergen? So there is no allergen, the patient took the medication, but the symptom is due to allergen counterintuitive, imaginative, interesting uh, questions here. So you use natural direct effect, uh, indirect effect, which says of a binary treatment T on the outcome Y, in our case, medication, with mediator X symptom, it's given by this counterfactual contrast, where the subscript XI, which is symptom is true, refers to the counterfactual distribution of the symptom, had pollen been true or outdoor, uh, allergen would have been true. Causality and knowledge graph. So we'll go a step further and to have explained these interesting questions, we'll bring in causal uh, knowledge graph in this picture. So before that, CauseNet, there's this interesting work uh, which talks about causality and knowledge graph where they have a large scale knowledge graph of claimed uh, causal relations between causal concepts. They extracted uh, the semi-structured and unstructured data set from web. They have more than 11 million causal relations <laughs> and causal con uh, concepts. The way they represent causality. So you have this for a path of one, success, uh, sorry, stress causes uh, illness, depression causes suicide, anxiety causes insomnia. When I increase the path length to two, where I include the mediator, so in our case, the mediator was symptom, but when you increase the path length to two, increase and put another variable in, uh, in the picture. So it cause, let's say stress causes illness, which we had seen in path one, but now illness causes death. Anxiety causes depression, and then depression causes suicide. Increasing the path length to three. And fear causes stress, stress causes illness, and then illness causes instability, disability. Inflammation causes pain, pain causes depression, and depression causes suicide. So out of these three different path lens, so the first path says anxiety causes insomnia, but the second path lens says anxiety causes depression. The concepts changed, the causal relations changed when you increase the number of paths, so they become inconsistent. Increasing the path length to three, inflammation causes pain, and then pain causes depression. So depression was earlier caused by anxiety, but now the causal link or the causal path from depression it, uh, to depression, it changed and became uh, pain. So it is inconsistent. So it starts with the binary relation. It says, as we first started, that causality is this A causes B, but causality is much more complex than A causes B. If there's a person uh, standing in front of me, I push the person, the person falls. It's not that simple that I push, I, uh, the person falls. I pushed, the person tripped, and then the person falls. So there is this intermediate mediator variable, which is causing, the, which is the tripping of this person, which is causing the person to fall. It's not just my pushing the person, which is causing the person to fall. So these type of um, relationship representation of causality with just A causes B misses out on those mediator relationships. And to further, ex uh, 
to further uh, have this to be in, uh, in, uh, inconsistency to, to solve this inconsistent problem, we can have a causal Bayesian network, which is built upon domain knowledge. So we know what is the cause of depression? Is it pain or is it anxiety which is causing it? So the current causal representation, as we have just seen in CauseNet, which is the first one, which says treatment causes outcome, is missing out on the mediator information, which is also required for interventional and counterfactual reasoning. The second one, which is, uh, you, uh, you have the uh, total causal effect in it. So you are adding information to this uh, simple A causes B binary relation. The third one, which we propose a hyperrelational uh, causal graph, which represents counterfactual, which is uh, represent, uh, expressed in mediator relation using the end, uh, natural direct effect and natural indirect effect. So causal uh, reasoning class requires understanding beyond perception. Causal knowledge graph combines vast amount of domain knowledge from the knowledge graph with the power of causal Bayesian network in modeling causal relations between entities and the associated weights. Using causal Bayesian network, one can identify the causal effects in the data, as we have seen in the uh, pediatric asthma example. And using the, uh, the, the causal knowledge graph, it adds a layer of explainability using external domain knowledge, which can help us analyze and understand the meaning of results obtained using the data and the causal Bayesian network. So we'll be able to understand, is it the pain which is causing depression or is it the anxiety causing the depression? With this extra domain knowledge or uh, extra uh, knowledge which is coming from the knowledge graph. So with causal Bayesian network, one can identify the effects. As we saw, we can identify the total causal effect, natural direct effect and natural indirect effect. And with knowledge graph, enriches the space allowing for richer reasoning. The questions that we asked about counterfactuals using uh, direct effect and indirect effect, it can help us in answering those counterfactual uh, questions better. So this is a general architecture of causal knowledge graph. You have data combining with uh, Bayesian network. You can estimate the causal uh, effects. So you have total causal effect, natural direct and natural indirect effect, along with the causal ontology and the uh, domain ontology along with the extra uh, incorporated in the external knowledge graph. We'll give you an, I'll give you an example of, uh, this is the study that we gave, we did a few years ago, K-Health, where we monitored pediatric, 150 pediatric asthma patient and collected 1,852 data points per patient per day. In the past study, we have observed correlational data. So the Bayesian network that I had used is coming from this, uh, this study that we did. So we observed correlation between symptoms and pollen and outdoor poll, uh, environment. So there's, there was a relation between if there's a pollen out there, the patient is more likely to have a symptom. If there's an uh, outdoor allergen out there, the patient is more likely uh, is correlated to having medication intake. And obviously, if there's a pa patient has a symptom of cough, cough or chest tightness, they'll take in medication intake. So this observation data, along with the asthma ontology, where we have concepts like air quality, controller medication, pollen, pollen level, and symptoms, we generate a causal Bayesian, uh, a causal knowledge uh, knowledge curve for this asthma. To exemplify this, we'll be using these two causal Bayesian network for this sake. So where first we have pollen as an outdoor and uh, allergen, we have air quality, and in the second one, we have air quality as an outdoor allergen. So let's say this would be, this is a causal knowledge graph for asthma, where the concepts like uh, grass type pollen, uh, grass pollen type, pollen level, pollen as a trigger, side effects, AQI level, AQI triggers, medication and symptoms, they're coming from the knowledge graph. And informations like natural indirect effect, a direct effect, total causal effect are estimated from the uh, causal Bayesian network. So what do you, you have this patient, let's say patient 90X, certain age and a medication. Now you want to know what is the effect of a certain trigger on the intake of medication, which is estimated by the total causal effect. So this total causal effect 10.51, it means that the person has more likely or 10.5% more likely to take a medication when the pollen is high or it has a pollen uh, has a level of 7.6 and glass, uh, grass pollen in the environment. For the natural direct effect, we had this question about 
given the pollen in the outdoor environment, what is the chance the patient took the medication, but the symptom was not due to the pollen? I'll read it again. Given the pollen in the outdoor environment, there is already allergen in the outdoor environment. What is the chance that the patient took the medication, but the symptom was not due to the uh, pollen? So according to this uh, natural indirect effect that we estimate for questions like this, it says that pollen has been tested as allergen because it's more likely that the patient would take a medication when there is a pollen because uh, since natural direct effect for pollen is higher than the AQI, which is out there in the environment. The reason why we did this, you cannot segregate allergens in the environment. And when you're trying to understand when different allergens in the environment, such as pollen, AQI, ozone, are all acting, how do you pinpoint what is the cause of patient symptoms or the intake of medication? And questions like these helps us understand that. The, the, uh, the reason that the patient took the medication, it's also, since it has no symptom, the reason for this uh, intake of medication was preventive which was common observation in this cohort. So most of the time, since they're asthma patients, they know if the pollen is going to be high, before having a symptom, they take this preventive measure of uh, taking the medication. So next, we'll talk about ontology and causal-based inference, which would be taken over by uh, Usha. Uh, thanks, Nini. That's a high-intensity presentation of yours. So. So good morning to everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you all today, at least remotely. Yeah. So am, am I audible? Yeah, you are now. Okay. So I'm Usha, a PhD student at A Institute, University of South Carolina, advised by Dr. Amishir. So today I'll be taking over the second part of the presentation tutorial today, ontology and knowledge-based inference for causal explanation. So uh, so in causal AI, let me give, introduce uh, the topic a bit before digging in deep. So in causal AI, to identify causal relationships between different variables or factors, ontologies actually provide a formal representation, a machine-readable representation of these variables and the relationships that we can use to reason about causality. And uh, they play an important role by providing a structured representation in a certain, in a specific domain of interest. So we can move on to the next slide. Okay. So the overview of this part of the presentation would be uh, starting with why uh, ontology-based causal inference is needed, and then uh, how do we construct an inference system to record explanations in the form of subclass and EZ hierarchy, and how do we establish a fundamental logic that expresses a fact that leads to another and how one fact explains another and how one, one fact leads to discover a new fact. And then we'll provide a cert set of formal inference patterns that uh, move from causal claims to explanations. And then as an example, we'll present a drug abuse ontology as a framework, which recognizes patterns in web-based data and in mental health care domain. Okay, so coming to this slide, why uh, causal inference? The correlational uh, machine learning seeks to identify patterns, but it often identifies false patterns that do not have any actual causal relationship. So for an example, if domain expert wants to see an explanation, the problem is that often these patterns uh, that correlational ML finds are spurious. So these patterns sometimes are not robust, so machine learning fundamentally makes an assumption that the data it sees in training is representative of the data that's being used in test data. And when that assumption is broken, machine learning is making a mistake. So for example, algorithms that work really well at reading uh, handwriting and recognizing objects and answering questions about certain images, they, they all can start to fail when the data is deploy, deployed on, um, if data is changed and deployed in different set of data. So as you can observe in that figure over here, Gbra versus Gbra crossing. So for decision-making, we need to find features that cause the outcome and estimate how that outcome would change if the features are changed. 
So for causal inference, where we can't directly calculate the causal effect, uh, you know, for ground truth validation and all, we have to always be estimating the counterfactual. If we do one thing, we have to see what would have happened otherwise if we do differently, as Nini said in the previous part. And data alone is not enough for uh, this kind of causal inference. So we need domain knowledge and assumptions to design to get the potential mechanisms that we see here. So ontology-based inference is basically a method for determining causality in a given system by using a formal representation of knowledge specific to a domain. So the basic idea behind it is if two events are related in a certain way, that one event may be the cause of the other. For example, if event A is a necessary condition for event B to occur, then A is likely to be the cause of B. So next slide, please. Okay. So in this slide, uh, I'll be presenting some interesting examples, like what clinicians wants to see versus what machine learning actually explains these predictions. Like if we use standard traditional ML techniques like Lime or SHAP. So the first example, so basically clinicians want to see machine learning predictions present in a way that it is understandable and interpretable in a, uh, that is useful to them. So here are some examples like uh, uh, what they want to see, like feature importance, model performance metrics, visualization explanations, right? But in terms of explanation, traditional ML uh, couldn't provide enough. So uh, first example, like in medical diagnosis, so an explanation using traditional Lyme or SHAP would highlight the most important features like symptoms, medical history, and test results. But it couldn't uh, you know, provide a more comprehensive explanation by showing the causal relationships between different factors uh, like diagnosis, risk factors, comorbidities, and treatments. Right, And in the next example, uh, when you are trying to predict the credit worthiness of a loan applicant, a, a traditional ML uh, technique would highlight the key factors like income, credit history, debt to income ratio, but it couldn't provide more holistic explanation by showing the causal relationships between different factors that affect credit risk, such as economic conditions, market trends, and government regulations. Similarly, if a customer wants to stop using a product or service like Netflix and all, Machine learning can uh, predict usage patterns, customer demographic satisfaction surveys while explaining the prediction, what contributed to the prediction, but it couldn't uh, provide the causal relationships between different factors that affect customers stopping the service, such as product features, customer support, and marketing campaigns. So that is all we are uh, coming to, like using ontology and knowledge graph to identify causal relationships over here. Next slide, please. Okay, so moving on to the ontology, what is uh, ontology based inference and what are the factors that affect it and what kind of classes or properties we use uh, from ontology. So it allows us to use, uh, as I said, formal representation of knowledge to analyze data and identify potential causal relationships. So, so there are different methods that are used, like uh, causal relevance, consistent consistency, specificity, strength, and coherence. So moving on to relevance, um, uh, we measure here which particular factor is relevant uh, to the outcome of interest. Suppose if a prediction is made, so which particular factor is actually relevant to the outcome of interest and it assesses the degree to which a particular factor affects the outcome, uh, which is in question. And in consistency, uh, uh, we actually uh, more care more about causal relationship with prior knowledge and background information. And uh, to what degree the causal relationship is consistent with what is already known about that uh, system. And in specificity, uh, we care about a particular cause, which particular cause leads to a specific effect rather than multiple effects. I mean, specificity of that particular relationship. And in strength, uh, which particular cause leads to a specific effect the strength of that, uh, the degree of and strength of that causal relationship. And in coherence, we care about the coherence of a set of causal relationship within a system, uh, which are consistent with each other, coherent and consistent with each other. So overall, these measures helps us to evaluate uh, the strength and relevance of causal relationships within a system. Next slide, please. Okay, you can click one more arrow here. Yeah. Okay, so how do we construct a, a causal inference system? 
So constructing causal inference system based on ontology for explanation involves these steps. So the general overview over here is the first step. In the first step, we define the domain of interest and we create a domain specific ontology. So ontology uh, has classes, properties, and relationships that are relevant to that particular domain. And the, as, and the next step, we gather data related to that domain. And that data is stored in the form of observations, experiments, and other sources. And then the next step would be identifying causal relationships. So using ontology and the gathered data, we identify potential causal relationships between different elements in that system we, we have been building. So this can be uh, done using techniques such as reasoning, causal reasoning, and or abduction. And uh, finally, we evaluate those causal relationships as discussed in the previous slides using uh, strength and relevance, like consistency, specificity, specificity, strength, and coherence. And then uh, the causal inference system can be implemented uh, uh, like in the form of various methods like Bayesian networks, Bayesian trees, or rule-based systems. So overall, the steps are like identifying the domain of interest and developing ontology, specifying the causal relationships, and then choosing a suitable uh, causal inference algorithm that aligns with that ontology, and uh, then testing, validating. So uh, we will discuss more uh, on the part that is highlighted in bold here, automatic or semi-automatic methods will depend on the complexity of problem and the available data. So we'll, we'll discuss different methods in the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. So in the next slide, uh, so here there are two main approaches to creating causal inference system, automatic and semi-automatic. So in, in automatic approach, uh, the entire process is automated. There is no human uh, interference. And this involves using uh, machine learning algorithms to identify causal relationships from data. And one common method is Bayesian network learning, which involves structure and parameters of Bayesian network from data. And in semi-automatic approach, we have human input at key stages, and it involves using tools and techniques that uh, support human experts uh, related uh, to that particular uh, context in the process of identifying and evaluating causal relationship. And some specific methods used in semi-automatic uh, include ontology-based causal discovery. It is also part of uh, semi-automatic. So this involves ontology to guide the process of causal discovery from data. So for example, the ontology might suggest a set of potential causal relationships that can be tested and evaluated. So overall, uh, the choice of automatic or semi-automatic methods will depend on complexity of problem, as I said in the previous slide. So, uh, so there are several hybrid approaches too that combine multiple methods, like a combination of uh, Bayesian network and ontology-based causal discovery to model causal relationship. Um, for example, in the context of gene expression data, the hybrid approaches are used. So, uh, so building such uh, systems has potential to provide like more structured and comprehensive way of understanding these uh, causal relationships. Next slide, please. Okay, so as an example, uh, let us uh, consider the mental health domain over here. So the right uh, side, the right part of the slide is showing you the ontology of different mental health uh, symptomology here, like appetite changes, fatigue, feeling of worthlessness, and uh, fatigue is actually mapped to anxiety disorders. So on the left side, um, so the left side text is extracted from Reddit that discusses mental health symptoms related to cardiovascular diseases. So here uh, we are we observe that uh, a woman is talking about her uh, pregnancy and her, her uh, uh, open heart surgery, and um, she uh, so that data is converted to a knowledge aware entity masking over here. So to explain the gender and mental health prediction as an example, how different genders are explaining their mental health symptoms and how can we identify gender depending upon the symptoms they are describing in the text? That is the goal. So to explain the gender and mental health prediction, it is crucial to understand causal mechanisms behind the association found in the text. So it enhances the reliability for differentiating the gender language in mental health symptoms. And such association in the text comes from different relations and hierarchy in ontology. 
So rules are ru rules in the rules are like based on is a is cause of has synonym has slang name has name etc. Between different individuals. So we begin by establishing a fundamental logic that enables us to express like how one fact leads to another and how one fact explains another and how one fact actually discovers new fact. So in the next slides, we'll be discuss, uh, discussing these things and we'll provide a set of formal inference patterns that move from causal claims to explanations and we'll discuss um, ontological principles in the coming up slides. So next slide, please. Okay, so formal inference patterns, causal claims to explanations. So one example of a set uh, over here that are uh, moving from claims to explanations is the process of abductive reasoning. So abduction is like a type of inference that starts with set of observations and it infer the most likely explanation for those observations. So it involves like uh, identifying possible explanations for observed phenomena and evaluating those observations, uh, like hypothesis based on their ability, uh, how they're accounting for uh, the already observed data. And another method in the middle, if you can see, is counterfactual reasoning. Okay, so this involves reasoning about what would have happened if causal factor had not been present, right? So for example, if we observe that smoking causes lung cancer, we can use counterfactual reasoning like what would have happened if the person had not smoked? So if you find that person would not have developed lung cancer in the absence of smoking, then we can use this to explain the causal relationship between smoking and lung cancer. So another type is like mechanistic reasoning. So which involves uh, uh, underlying mechanisms that actually connect these causal factors and outcomes. So for example, so if we observe that a drug reduces the symptoms of a disease, we can use mechanistic reasoning to explain how that drug works to produce this effect. So we can identify the biological pathways that are involved and explain how the drug, how the drug is being modified in these pathways to produce the final effect. So another is Bayesian reasoning, which we already discussed. So next slide, please. Okay. So some more uh, examples on justifying explanations or outcomes. So here we'll be discussing uh, the ontological principles um, and not the inference patterns. So these examples actually demonstrate how ontological principles can be used to explain causal relationships and how different principles may be more appropriate depending on the specific context and nature of phenomenon that is being uh, studied. Okay. So then in the first example, the relationship between the smoking and lung cancer, we call it determinism because it is used to explain that smoking is a deterministic cause of lung cancer. This, mean, this means that smoking is believed to be the direct cause of lung cancer and this relationship is predictable and consistent. So such relationship is called deterministic relationship. And in probabilistic relationship, uh, we take here uh, air pollution and respiratory disease. So probabilism is actually used to explain the exposure to air pollution. And uh, we think that it is a probabilistic cause of respiratory disease. That means uh, that exposure to air pollution increases the probability of de developing that disease, but it doesn't it does not guarantee that uh, someone will develop them, like everyone will develop them. So such such relation, such causal relation uh, ontology principle over here is probabilism. And in mechanism, we take over uh, new medication and health condition. So how uh, new medication works to elevate symptoms, that means the medication is believed to interact with specific physiological processes in, in the body. And uh, in contextualism, uh, we take poverty and mental health. So contextualism here is used to explain that causal relationship between poverty and mental health can vary depending on the specific context, like uh, in which the poverty uh, is experienced. For example, poverty may have a greater impact on mental health in areas with fewer resources and support services, right? And finally, reductionism, uh, which is between genetics and obesity. Uh, it is used to explain that genetic factors contribute to development of obesity by influencing individual metabolic processes and energy balance. This means that obesity can be understood by examining like individual genetic and physiological con components that contribute to it. So these are the five uh, ontological principles to justify explanations and outcome. Um, okay, next slide, please. 
<clears throat> so as I said, uh, we uh, use drug abuse ontology here as a framework and an example to uh, uh, practically see uh, the previous slides uh, uh, as an example. So drug abuse ontology, to introduce drug abuse ontology, um, it, is, uh, it is defined using 101 ontology development, which is like uh, 101 method includes determining the domain and scope of ontology and defining the classes, properties, and creating instances of the classes. So as you can see in the right side, um, we have ontology metrics, class axioms, and individual axioms. So uh, DAO drug abuse ontology has three, one, five classes, 315 classes, 31 relationships, and more than 900 instances among the classes. So we use uh, this ontology to integrate it with uh, ML algorithms, and we observed that uh, uh, we, uh, the false alarm rate is dramatically decreased uh, by adding this external knowledge to the machine learning process. And this ontology is uh, recurrently updated to capture evolving concepts from dark web and social media, web forums like uh, blue light and subreddit and Reddit conversations. So this actually provides a very power powerful framework and um, this can be expanded to a wide range of uh, substance use research, mental health domain research and epidemiology research. The citation is given below. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, we kept this structure over here in terms of how one fact leads to another and how this drug abuse, is, uh, drug abuse ontology is actually deployed and where it is sitting exactly in an end-to-end -end architecture. So, um, yeah, so this is demonstrating the use of DAO. And first module is data collection module. We have about 1 million posts uh, over here from about 35,000 users. And the second part is automatic coding module that is semantically annotating the post using uh, DAO ontology. And the third part over here is data analysis and interpretation module to visualize the concepts found within posts and referenced within ontology. So we have three parts over here. So let us zoom on to the part that matters and is relevant to this tutorial, which is uh, drug abuse ontology, the second part, and uh, how how we are exactly extracting, how information extraction module is uh, designed over here. Next slide, please. Okay, so ontology-based annotations and in drug use domain. So zooming on to the second part, this is uh, the, uh, expansion of that second part. So here, what we are doing is we are focusing on web forum data related to non-medical use of uh, uh, buprenorphine. So the architecture we have previously seen is uh, to uh, focus on web forum data and use of this particular drug called buprenorphine was defined as non-prescribed when used without medical supervision. But uh, there is always a level of uncertainty in disaggregating prescribed versus non-prescribed use in web-based discussions. So it is hard to uh, you know, classify them. And some of the questions and practices shared by individuals actually provide indicators about non-prescribed use, like saying, uh, I have taken suboxin from a friend or I have cut it up and used in smaller amounts. So we can understand that it is non-prescribed use. So suboxin and subutex are like synonyms of buprenorphine, which are referenced from ontology. And it is the only controlled substance that may be prescribed for opioid addiction by a licensed physician in, in a clinical setting. So the overall purpose of the previous architecture we have shown was to study user-generated web web forum discussions about this particular drug, like suboxin, subutex, buprenorphine, naloxin, all this, all, all are same. Okay, so uh, this describes like how tests are automatically on annotated using drug abuse ontology. And here, if you see, we identify drug entities, dosage, time interval, route of administration, administering the drug. And the term buke we have identified in the text would not have been possible without defining it as a slang term in drug abuse ontology. And you can also see that uh, onto this particular ontology is actually capable of mapping units from mg to milligram and understanding slang terms and synonyms. So, and adding this ontology as an external source of knowledge in identifying triples and entities in data is actually a big plus point over here. And conceptualizing the domain in data acts as a prior requirement for processing this further information. And also the left part of this uh, cannabis. So, 
So buprenorphine is, is normally uh, also used with poly drug use. So uh, the other kind of drugs like opioid addictions, uh, buprenorphine, methadone, uh, are also used in with in a poly drug use context. So we have all these kind of superclass has long term has side effect brand name chemical formula for each entity in ontology. Next slide, please. Okay. So, okay, so how one fact discovers a new fact? So, though, as I said in the previous slide, the opioid addiction treatment drugs, buprenorphine and methadone, they are commonly prescribed for treatment of withdrawal symptoms, which is a fact that is known. So, how this fact led to a newer fact? So, when um, in our analysis of web forums, we found that Lopermide is widely used for a similar purpose. And uh, drug abuse ontology revealed that uh, lopermide was also used as a treatment and uh, uh, a way to withdraw from symptoms related to opioid addiction in uh, where uh, buprenorphine and methadone are commonly prescribed. Okay, so, uh, so uh, this analysis of web forums led uh, to three toxicology studies, which led to F FDA warning. So if you see over here in this slide, uh, we, we identify lopermide and withdrawals in connection with the already known fact of buprenorphine methadone uh, used for withdrawal symptoms. So, yeah. So this concludes my presentation on ontology-based inference. So, so my colleague will be, Kaushik will be dealing with the next part of the presentation, discussing applications in web and healthcare. Thank you. I think to clarify here is that um, uh, in the real world, uh, when you are trying to understand um, the uh, uh, cause and effect, um, things can be very complicated. So here, um, use of um, lopramide uh, or imodium AD and uh, along with other things in uh, you know managing the side effect of um, uh, uh, of of uh, uh, Managing the side effect of use of uh, opioid, uh, buprenorphine, yeah. um, that kind of uh, understanding of what causes what uh, is very complex, and it requires, uh, given the data in this case web forum, understanding all the components of the data, how they are related to each other. Uh, these are uh, complicated things. Uh, you also have to work very hard at combining the signals. So when you want to say A causes B. Um, and you only have very small amount of instances to support that, it becomes very difficult or, or, or not very, you know, you can't be sure about it. By using the semantic techniques, in this case, the use of ontology, uh, like drug, drug abuse ontology, uh, you are able to uh, combine the signals. You bu, bup, subutex, sub, subaxin, buprenorphine, all of those things are the same thing, and their signals were combined so that you can study the cause of cause and effect kind of situation. Uh, and, and that is the important thing. So just having the, um, you know, uh, theory of uh, a causality is not sufficient. When practice, when you practice that on uh, uh, real world messy data, uh, particularly in this case, human generated data, social media data, uh, you, you need to do a whole lot of things. And this is what Usha tried to uh, demonstrate with one example. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Okay. Over to you, Gashi. So uh, uh, I'll be talking about the applications of um, uh, once you have a causal uh, knowledge graph. So it's question you talked about how to the uh, how to construct a causal knowledge graph. Usha talked about how an ontology can be used to formalize the knowledge graph that is constructed. Now I'll start talking about if uh, you have such a knowledge graph uh, with causal structure, then what kind of benefits can you get from it in healthcare specifically? Okay, That's next it. slide. Uh, so uh, in a typical model for uh, suicidality, uh, there are a lot of factors that have been established in previous literature um, that um, can be used to um, uh, tell about somebody's mental health outcomes. 
So these are ranging from genetic factors, uh, socioeconomic factors, biological factors to uh, psychological and physiological factors. And then there are in the middle also uh, things that you would expect, which is other diseases that may be causing suicidality. So you can see here that the factors involved in this are are sort of broad and and so we need a little more structure to determine really what causes what it's hard for a purely correlational model to determine any of these uh, circles without extra knowledge guiding the analysis so what normally happens now is because of the immense success of uh, transformer based uh, language model architectures in many tasks People try to plug it in for uh, use cases such as these even to see how well they can capture maybe some causal structure. And for that, they use Reddit posts um, from a bunch of users um, across time. So then that becomes a sequence of posts for an individual user. And for each individual user, now they have a, a time series type sequence information, which a transformer is uh, trained for. It's a sequence to sequence model. So you then feed that uh, post using a numeric representation to the transformer and you predict the output of the random variable of interest, in this case, suicidality. So uh, this process has achieved, this process has achieved um, up to uh, actually just 52% accuracy, which is mm, really bad and for healthcare domain. So uh, with question in next slide. Okay, so then if we try to uh, look into the literature uh, and uh, narrow down more um, factors that are more directly relevant to something like suicidality, we come up with the uh, variables on the right. So these are expert designed latent factors. And um, still among these uh, expert designed latent factors, it is not clear if the structure is uh, in what direction. So you see arrows going everywhere. So then finally, we move to a source called the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Index, which gives us a structure to follow among these random variables. So this is a causal in the sense that we must determine certain random variables before the other. So you have to determine if a person wishes to be dead. And only then can you uh, move on to determining non-specific active suicidal thoughts and so on further down the tree. Next question. Uh, so here, um, once uh, this kind of structure is put into a machine learning algorithm, uh, we see the benefits of uh, how it can help the end user. So by the end user, I mean the expert uh, clinician who has uh, who wants to use this system to assist them in their diagnosis. So here you can see for a post, uh, there are highlights as part of the post corresponding to uh, three of the concepts from the suicide scale. And those highlights uh, typically would be the end of it in a traditional explainable machine learning system uh, to tell the expert that these highlights correspond to something of interest. But here, because we have also the causal structure, we can go further to say that concept one was found to be true, which is why we checked for concept two, which was also found to be true, which is why we checked for concept three. And this is a more comprehensive explanation. And more importantly, it's in line with what the expert clinicians use in practice. And so you can reliably label it a suicidality related context from the book, which in this case is behavior attempt. Okay, next. So here is a brief glimpse into how we formalize this into the, while incorporating the uh, background knowledge into uh, the machine learning algorithm. So uh, I'll touch upon it briefly, and then we can talk about it more later in questions. Um, so you, what you see in the math equation above is uh, it's uh, the algebraic form of a decision structure. So uh, strictly speaking, decision trees are sub uh, is a subclass of decision structures, and knowledge graphs are also a subclass of decision structures. And you can write an algebraic form that encompasses both cleanly. So that's what we did. And once you do that, 
you only have to learn the parameter for what goes down to the leaves of each particular decision, which is far fewer than say billions and trillions of parameters that you would have to in a over parameterized neural network. So uh, this is uh, both a benefit in terms of computational uh, efficiency and uh, globally optimization, global optimization objectives, but also more crucially, more interest to me and is that you can provide explanations that the clinician understands and you can be sure that the explanations will be consistent every time you run this algorithm because of the global objective. Uh, what we went ahead and also did is to deploy this model on a, using a web plugin on the Reddit subreddit from which this data was obtained. And then we evaluated it with uh, the expert clinicians who helped us design this system. And uh, of course, to prevent for bias, we the when we uh, gave it to them for evaluations, we didn't tell them that the system outputs are from our system. We gave them three systems, one from ours, one from uh, the state-of-the-art language model, and one uh, the third one is with the state-of-the-art language model, augmented with the best available explainable AI technique. So the expert clinicians uh, chose explanations from this model, 70% uh, of the times versus 40 up to 48% uh, for the other two systems. So that's a drastic jump. Uh, so we can see here that if you uh, really pay attention to the causal modeling aspect, uh, then uh, humans can much better utilize these systems. And also I'll touch upon before we leave this slide is the, with, although we tried this out on mental health, there is the same causal structure that uh, can be um, the same principles of causal structure establishment and then reliable explanation construction along with robust prediction is applicable to broader domains such as cooking and um, other things. Okay, next. Okay, with that, I'll pass it on to Dr. Shet. Uh, Dr. Shat, you're on mute. I'll make a few remarks about explainability. So whenever you are finding any uh, correlation causations, uh, you really uh, want to explain um, in many application domains, particularly in application domains, uh, without explanation, uh, you cannot act upon, you cannot make the decisions. Slide, next. So, um, what you want to be able to do is uh, that in the causality, uh, when you have a knowledge-based approach, then you have uh, the appropriate uh, representation or domain understanding that allows you to formulate your explanations in the form that the end user, let's say the user is the uh, clinician uh, for whom you are uh, helping with um, uh, diagnosis or uh, treatment, then uh, you want to be able to explain uh, the results, uh, whatever you found, or you know, the causes that you found that this uh, um, uh, symptom is caused by these uh, particular uh, triggers. Then you want to be able to explain them in the terms that they are um, used to, familiar with, and in fact, required to use. Uh, if, if, if a doctor um, uh, uh, is working on patient data and talking to a patient, uh, he or she is required to use clinical uh, guideline, clinical practice guideline uh, in deciding um, what to do. So you need to be able to explain the things in the terms that they understand. Next. So here is an example, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's a post here and um, uh, in this particular case, uh, this uh, paper in CIKM 2018, uh, you uh, use purely statistical model and it gave you the wrong um, uh, results in this particular case. Next. Uh, and in, um, you know, so the, uh, uh, the state-of-the-art model was able to predict depression, but the uh, correct thing is obsessive compulsive disorder. 
it's not the main part of this tutorial for me to explain why we could use the knowledge and get the a better uh, you know uh, result um, here but i want to show you why the knowledge plays role in constructing the explanations uh, so go next so what we what I want to explain is how causal inference can serve as a bridge between prediction and decision making. What happens here is that um, in addition to um, you know, all the data analysis we can do with a deep learning algorithm, you're adding a knowledge. In this case, you can see this DSM-5 knowledge graph. And because of that, uh, you are able to um, uh, improve uh, the classification. In this case, it, it ends up being OCD. Um, the use of a knowledge graph uh, made that difference uh, compared to the best uh, um, machine learning algorithm. But let us now look at the next, again, go to the next slide. So what happens is that um, uh, the use of background knowledge or knowledge graph uh, improves um, both the uh, classification uh, as well as uh, helps you align with the, uh, uh, with the explanation. So here, what you are seeing is that there are certain terms you can see uh, in the text, the terms like bisexuality or chaos in my relationship. Using the knowledge graph, you are able to classify them or you, you're able to connect them to the terms uh, that then links those terms uh, to the definition of OCD. So for example, in the, OCD, there is a concept of um, intrusive thought. And um, the, uh, uh, that may be explicitly mentioned in the text. There may be other concepts uh, uh, where it may not be very explicitly uh, said. So you may have feeling of um, uh, hopelessness, but uh, in the definition, you may have level of mood or you have intrus intrusive thought, but ultimately you are interested in uh, you know, uh, disturbance in thinking. And by being able to make those connections, um, uh, you know, from the text to the concepts, you are going to be able to align uh, the explanation of uh, what the text says and what the uh, definition is. So now you can tell the clinician that this one is OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, because all of the concepts in the definition which you know uh, in, in the medical definition of this term are uh, supported by the text in your uh, that, that 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 you are analyzing. This is uh, you know a key thing. Without having this uh, knowledge graph, it be you know just pure statistical uh, processing would make it nearly impossible for you to construct the explanation in the form that is appropriate for uh, the end user. Uh, in this case, clinician. Next. So I think that's probably the main concept I want to talk about. Uh, so, uh, you know, we distinguish between um, the uh, different classes of explainability. Uh, first, you have, you know, purely, purely data driven system, you have statistical explainability. So, it generates an expression for the co occurrence of the given phenomena. Um, now, that is highly unsatisfactory in most cases. Then you have uh, what we call as contextual explainability. So that is to generate a human understandable expression by taking the context information uh, of a given observation into the account. And this is uh, also uh, you know, uh, uh, supported by what we had earlier described, what Utkarshan is described as interventional reasoning. And finally, um, using the domain model, um, you are able to, or knowledge graph, you are able to create a uh, domain experimentality because you're able to construct the counterfactual uh, and uh, you're able to uh, look at all the possibilities and then uh, come to a uh, well-reasoned argument saying, this is because of this, this is in presence of this, in the absence of this other consideration, this doesn't occur. And so for that, we can create all these counterfactuals and then uh, provide the experimentality in the form that um, you know is appropriate for the end user. Okay, so these are the uh, you know uh, 
uh, core takeaways, statistical AI alone is not enough. Causal AI can be used for generating explanations. Um, causal AI can be used for complex casual pattern extra extraction. And you know, we gave several examples of uh, complexity that occur, especially with the um, uh, you know, messy data. Causal AI can be used for causal entity associations and causal AI can be used for interventional planning using web data in application areas. And uh, you know, because we wanted to focus here on healthcare, we're talking about epidemiology, mental health as examples. Now let's open up to the questions um, from the audience. Utkashni, take over. Yes. So, found this concept in the discovery? Yes. So, causal search is synonymously used for causal discovery, where you're trying to figure out the graphical structure of the model. Thank you. And the second question is, uh, you have mentioned the causal background of network, right? So, uh, do, do you think that kind of representation of the causal uh, relationships? Yes. And is corresponding learning algorithm is a method to obtain that kind of uh, uh, relationship model? Can you, can, can you repeat that question? Uh, the in, structure learning algorithm as a representation for uh, cause learning causal Bayesian network? Yeah, I mean, how to obtain that kind of uh, causal Bayesian network? So there are two ways you can obtain this causal Bayesian network, either from the domain uh, domain expert knowledge. So the example that I showed you about pedi uh, pediatric asthma patient, where a colon is a ca uh, causes a symptom and at the same time causes the intake, intake of medication. That uh, Bayesian network is obtained from the domain expert knowledge. We had a clinician involved with us in the study, and based on the data, his uh, experience, we came up with that causal Bayesian network. Another approach is to learn from the data. So there are structure learning algorithms. Famously, one is PC algorithm. There is fully conditional independence algorithms, where you can directly learn from the data, even if you, if you don't have any domain expert knowledge. If you have expert knowledge, along with the data set, you can explicitly mention, let's say the algorithm doesn't learn this relation between colon and medication intake, but from the expert, you know that this edge or this relation ex exists in, uh, uh, in this uh, network. So you can explicitly mention in that algorithm that you have to give it a higher weight when you're learning it. So there has to be this relation between colon and medication intake. Thank you. And so this leads to my... Another question is about the comparative um, description to the factual causal relationships. Should, yes. So, it, so just like the webinar we have mentioned, you need a kind of uh, approach. Uh, can you repeat that question? I mean, the, and yeah, just to have you mentioned the, the domain knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So is it a kind of uh, on part? On domain part? knowledge as an ontology? Yeah. Domain knowledge is coming also coming from the knowledge graph part. So we do have ontology, and then from the ontology, you can create a knowledge graph. So you have the expert knowledge there and the domain knowledge. So it's a, so that, it's a more philosophical way. No, it is not. You have you have instances, so you can populate the ontology to uh, to create a knowledge graph out of it. Thanks. That's a good good question. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, um, thank you so much for the um, very nice. I just have a very basic question. Sure, sure, go ahead. I'm sorry, but um, so the first question is uh, what method you could use to do for finding the name specific entity? So I heard this thing mentioned about some graph names. Yes. So do you use any basic model or how do you use that? So, so Usha, that's a question for you. So uh, can you <laughs> repeat yeah, your question a little bit louder? So what factors, uh, met methods you used for identifying domain specific entities? In the text. So in, in the, text. So in the uh, web text and also in the mental health? Imagine you have a text, so you just show the text in the presentation. The question is what method you use on the domain specific entities? So uh, we deployed customized uh, name entity recognition algorithms, which is using drug abuse ontology in it, along with the standard NER. 
So NER standard NER is used to actually identify entity of interest like a uh, drug name and um, uh, what uh, route of administration and uh, quantities, measures, prices, etc. And then we uh, infer from ontology like which entity is mapped to which class or subclass depending upon uh, the data we identified. Did that answer? Can you like the model name because? You're not audible. Yeah, you can come here and ask. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, you can just maybe you can just come stand here and ask. That's so, okay. Uh, basically, the question is uh, so Is he audible, Usha? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> So the question is, um, so we have some pre-trained model, let's say spacey models, right? Uh, yes. Models cannot identify some entities. So the question is, did you customize your own entity model or did you use different techniques? So I just wanted to know what models did you use to find those specific entities? Yeah, so so we, uh, we start. Usha, I think we had that slide about uh, Ontology, ontology base, rule base, and uh, yes, yes. Use, use yes. So, yeah. Hmm. No, no, you left. Okay. Next one. No. This no. one. No, no, the one with the example. Yeah, this one. So we used. Uh, uh, rule-based models, statistical models, and then we built hybrid models, which is like a combination of rule-based, statistical, and machine learning. And then we uh, deployed ontology to refer to the, uh, we identified entities from an ontology, and then we actually uh, evaluated e each approach and we tried to improve the accuracy of entity identification. So for example, if you see over here, uh, we have two milligrams of auxins, uh, and then uh, BUP, it, we identified BUP because BUP is listed as a synonym um, for the, what do you see here? Buprenorphine. Buprenorphine in ontology without uh, it uh, listed over there, it's impossible to identify BUP in this text. So it is obviously a customized uh, uh, algorithm, which we uh, use for this ontology in the loop. Okay. And the second part of the same question is, so, you know, in medical text, we have negation. So let's say, I do not have headache. So if we talk about headache as a entity, how do mm -hmm. you give such negations in the text? Okay, handling negation is actually an NLP problem. So we process the text before uh, we do this. So we handle the negation first and then we go with the entity processing. Yeah, so for example, if we have a text, say, uh, I do not have a headache. And if uh, we are finding whether a patient has a problem or not, and if we just simply take that not out, so we are basically eliminating the problem. No, see, see if you look at this example, there is um, uh, underlying, um, all the concepts that we understood are in color or underlined. So you see, you didn't do shit. That is uh, a negated uh, text and the system was able to identify that. Okay. So, um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, you know, there was an explicit attempt to uh, capture the negation. Yeah. yeah. So how, how was that negation found basically? Was there any specific technique? To do so we use, uh, you know, uh, dependency parsing methods to identify that syntactic relationship between that negation words in a sentence. So after identifying the scope of negation, like how many entities up the boundary of the negation word, so depending dependency parsing can help us to uh, determine that particular word in the sentence. That is one uh, method technique we have used. Got you. Thank you so much.
And the, the last question, I'm sorry, once again, the, the intent of societal ideation. So like, did you find, like, did you use any contextual model or how was that used? So uh, we, uh, can you go to that slide, uh, Karshini, that, that uh, tree decision, like a decision tree of suicide ideation? Yeah. Okay, so for here, sure. yeah. Karshi, is he here, okay. Yeah. So uh, for suicidal ideation, um, the specific intent is identified uh, using the algorithm we briefly displayed. So uh, you can think of it as, uh, generally speaking, uh, a neural network would identify it by vectorifying a piece of text and then doing a cosine similarity match with this particular piece of text corresponding to different uh, aspects of suicidality uh, that you see here. Uh, but instead of doing that purely statistical approach, we augment that similarity with knowledge-guided concepts. So it is more robust at identifying uh, concepts that are related to suicide, but the inner mechanism, you can think of doing achieving this uh, a similar thing. Uh, does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Mm. Any more questions? So it is end to end. Yes, it is into it. So in that sense, how would you really try and suggest the timing of this? Because if you do this as well, one of the issues is you don't, you actually not think the ratio of those graphs for the information. Because they don't, I mean, you just keep, you just keep it very simple to the model saying that here, here's the data, and you're supposed to know the graph and the graph and how it's not supposed, it's not very true. So that's the problem for causal search or causal discovery where you're giving the data to the algorithm and the algorithm is learning the structure on its own. So like even, even after you know the structure, because if, if for example, you don't know the structure, you know the pattern. Mm -hmm. like, so this is not a causal Bayesian network. Yeah, I'm just saying, it, okay. it could be a, it, it could be a uh, causal Bayesian network. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it, although it's, it's, it's undirected, so you have the directness of open, but if, if you just consider like one directness, you could probably decompose it into different factors, like six small factors, which people call like causal mechanisms, right? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the ways for doing it is learn a single Bayesian, causal Bayesian network for that single factor, then you decompose, and then re recompose, uh, recompose the whole thing into an advanced framework. Because that allows you to uh, disentangle like single factors, one and the other, right? Otherwise, so just to start for this uh, problem statement, for the uh, pediatric asthma problem statement, we have separate Bayesian networks. So I've showed two Bayesian networks, right? one for pole and another one for uh, AQI. But going down the line, we would want to combine into one network where you have just outdoor allergen as one component, which can deal with, okay, one could be for, could have different uh, concepts, pollen or AQI. But then it would be again, uh, a causal, one causal mechanism when you're dealing with uh, pollen at one time and then AQI, AQI at another time, so. I think a, a little bit related to that. So when you talk about uh, ontology, you know, when you talk about this knowledge mm -hmm. uh, so is it always be like binary, like, like, like for example, by the KPI system, or all, all, you, all you need to try to de you define it based on expert uh, knowledge? Yes, so ontology is always based on the uh, expert knowledge. It's built using, not using, but basically uh, with the help of domain expert. Right. So if you just look at the ontology part, it's going to be A causes B sort of relationship. Right. There is, uh, if you want to add hyper, uh, mediator relations, then you have to look about uh, go into hyper-relationals. Okay. 
Yes, it's direct uh, cyclic graph. Yes. That's the definition. Yes. I, I think one of the things that tends to be for is a like chain graph, which is really specific for uh, a cyclic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Naturally, some of the phenomena that we observe, like in real life, it's actually undivided. Yes. We don't find if everything was shared, it's like, like a chain phenomenon. So it, it, it doesn't always be like, you know, directly. So I don't know whether it is. That, that, that's a good point. We have not explored it because we are just restricting to a small network right now to figure out intervention and if we can do intervention and counterfactual reasoning using causal knowledge graph. But moving forward, that's uh, an approach that we have thought about a bit, but maybe we can <laughs> use yeah, it. Yeah, that's, 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 that's very yeah. Chain graphs are interesting. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right now we don't, but maybe like in future we, we we'll update we'll up, upload some code. Then you can definitely look at it. Right. Oh, okay. uh, I have two follow uh, two follow up questions for the proper statement. First of all, the first question is about the experiment way. So we should be quickly find the node uh, in the advance and then just learn the relation switch between the nodes. Or we need to learn the both the nodes and the different relationships and see at end to end rate. So we have predefined the nodes right now. So we should predefine them. Right? Okay. So the second question is a little bit more general. As far as I know, the uh, research on the code discovery has been uh, maybe uh, I, I can't use the word at the stop, but it, there's no obvious progress again you know, about the decade. So um, what do you think is the limitation uh, or is the obstacle for this? Adjection, or there are some, uh, are there some the uh, difference you, uh, you can explore to on the uh, discovery? So, for the causal discovery, that's a good question, actually. Hmm. Because um, if many uh, top top tier machine learning banks like NIT, uh, SNL, we have noticed that there's, there's no many uh, papers on the causal discovery. And I have to some is an expert in this area, and they told me that this area has stopped, uh, stopped many years. So one recent work that uh, we came across was uh, by Yoshua Benjua for uh, GFlow nets yeah. for learning causal Bayesian network. So yeah, um, maybe that could be uh, another possible extension for or another approach to track or learn learn causal Bayesian networks. That's the recent one. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for being a great audience, being patient with us during uh, internet issues. So thanks a lot.